Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. This is a very special occasion as we are gathered to celebrate the great work done by some extraordinary librarians from around the country. Tonight's honorees were selected from nearly 2,000 incredibly worthy nominations. It was inspiring to see so many qualified, passionate people who are making such an impact on the lives of others through their work. This is a night to congratulate and honor all of you who continue to carry the mantle of educating the public and advancing information that is so crucial to an informed society. We are also celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Carnegie Corporation of New York. We will be hearing from Vartan Gregorian, president of the Carnegie Corporation, who has been a long-standing friend and great supporter of libraries. But first, we will hear from Caroline Kennedy, whose book, Jacqueline Kennedy, Historic Conversations on Life with John F. Kennedy, is a New York Times bestseller. Caroline has continued the Kennedy family tradition of public service. Her commitments involve many nonprofit boards, from the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund to the American Ballet Theater, and from the Commission on Presidential Debates to the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. Her work with New York City public schools, overhauling the school's private fundraising, raising seed money to test new reforms, and persuading New Yorkers to get involved in the schools in meaningful ways has been applauded by all. So it is my great privilege and pleasure to introduce Caroline Kennedy. Thank you so much. Good evening. And thank you for inviting me to join you at this special celebration. First, I wanted to thank the New York Times for hosting us and Janet Robinson for your continuing commitment to schools and libraries. We all wish we could have had you as our teacher. <laughs> I would also like to salute Vartan Gregorian, whose passion for libraries, learning, is unparalleled and contagious. You are a worthy heir to Andrew Carnegie and have been a wonderful friend to my mother and to my uncle Teddy. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, one of the educators I most admire who's here tonight, um, Barbara Stripling, who's the Director of Library Services at the New York City Department of Education. Uh, yeah. Barbara has really transformed school libraries in this city. She is a generous friend and an inspirational leader and has made a real difference in the lives of one of the 1.1 million students in New York City schools. I'm honored to join you tonight to celebrate 10 outstanding librarians and the thousands more that you represent. This award is truly significant because the nominations received from across the country show that libraries continue to play a critical role in our democracy and that librarians are once again on the front lines of a battle that will shape the future of our country. It's a battle that's fought largely out of you and the heroes, you, are people who didn't seek a career of confrontation but who live lives of principle and meaning, understanding that the gift of knowledge is the greatest gift that we can give one another. One of the hallmarks of a great civilization is the preservation of and access to information, libraries. We all know that the library at Alexandria was one of the wonders of the ancient world, and we've all learned that our founding fathers believed that libraries were essential to the growth of America. Benjamin Franklin helped to found the Library Company of Philadelphia, and Thomas Jefferson's personal library became the Library of Congress. But this illustrious history doesn't explain why libraries are so often under attack, even in our own time. Why is it that Mao's army destroyed Tibetan libraries? Why did the Germans target the medieval library in Louvain, Belgium, and follow that with the sweeping destruction and confiscation of libraries throughout Central Europe? Why did the Serbs burn the great multicultural Bosnian National Library? And here at home, why were nine people arrested in 1961 during the first read-in at a segregated public library in Jackson, Mississippi? And why did the Patriot Act seek to obtain the personal borrowing records of library patrons? Not only because libraries are important symbols of a civilized society, but because they are, in a sense, tabernacles of personal freedom freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of opportunity, 
and the true test of liberty, freedom to dissent. In times of great political turmoil, libraries are a bastion of civil liberties. But in calmer times, they're integrated into every aspect of our lives. One of the most exciting rituals of childhood is getting our first library card. And last year, one third of all Americans over the age of 15, or 77 million people, used a public library. There could be no more compelling statistic. Yet once again, libraries are under attack, this time from an insidious adversary, indifference and lack of funds. Access to knowledge is seen as a luxury when times are tough. Though in a difficult economic climate, we know that people need and use libraries more than ever. Libraries are no longer hushed reading rooms, but busy social hubs for the exchange of life skills and information. They become community centers in the very best sense, places where we build community and weave together lives and dreams. The unemployed come to find job training and job opportunities. New immigrants come to learn English. Students use the library for college readiness and college access. And adolescents can explore difficult social and emotional issues in the safe space of a library. I've seen this firsthand in my work with the New York City Public Schools. Classroom libraries play a vital role in students' intellectual development, and school libraries fill a larger void in their lives. A great school library becomes the heart of a school and the center of the larger community. A great school librarian understands that kids can't succeed without the support of parents, teachers, business partners, and 21st century research and writing skills. That's why we've made libraries a special focus of the New York City school reform efforts. Under Barbara Stripling's leadership, the DOE has created a new curriculum, which is a national model, and trained an energized, creative, professional cadre of school librarians who understand that they have the power to make a difference, that they are no longer the person who just keeps everyone quiet, but they are really one of the most important teachers that the students have. At the Fund for Public Schools, we've learned that when a principal and a librarian work together to make literacy a real priority, a relatively small amount of money can make a huge difference in the culture of a school community. Over the past eight years, we've given $8.5 million to schools and 225 small competitive grants. These bring schools up to date technologically, support family literacy workshops, build collections for English language learners, and provide comfy furniture where kids can hang out with a book. Now as we move towards implementation of the Common Core Standards, the role of the librarian is becoming even more important. We need librarians who understand how to integrate technology into their curriculum and who can help students learn the higher order critical thinking skills they will need to succeed. The other library that I'm a part of is the Kennedy Library in Boston. In addition to preserving the documents and archival record of my father's presidency for scholars and researchers, thanks to my husband's far-reaching vision, vision, the Kennedy Library has broken free from its Boston home. To celebrate the 50th anniversary of my father's presidency, we embarked on a multi-year effort to digitize his papers, correspondence, memos, speeches, photos, and film holdings. The record of his presidency is now available online to a worldwide audience in their own languages. We've also created a website for students, jfk50.org, with downloadable curricula and exhibits, where users can also upload their own testimonials about service in the spirit of President Kennedy. None of these efforts would have been possible without dedicated, committed, and visionary librarians, professionals, who are excited about their changing role in a changing world, who are dedicated to serving others, who respect scholarship, and who understand that you are our guides on a lifelong journey of intellectual collaboration and collaborative composition. Your work is truly life-changing. As Ralph Aldo Emerson wrote many years ago, be a little careful about your library. Do you foresee what you will do with it? Very little, to be sure. But the real question is, what will it do with you? You will come here and get books that will open your eyes and your ears and your curiosity and turn you inside out or outside in. Congratulations to all of you, and thanks so much.
Thank you, Caroline. And now I'd like to introduce Vartan Gregorian, president of the Carnegie Corporation of New York. As I have said, this year, Carnegie Corporation celebrates its 100th anniversary, and Vartan and his staff have done a truly exceptional job of planning the celebration of this important milestone. During this year-long celebration, Vartan has showcased the outstanding philanthropy of Andrew Carnegie and the fine work of the many institutions that bear his name. He has brought well-deserved attention to an extraordinary philanthropic legacy and to the values of education, libraries, science, and international peace. He has demonstrated his leadership everywhere he has been, from the University of Pennsylvania to Brown University to the New York Public Library, and now, of course, to Carnegie. Vartan's message about all libraries is that they are not a luxury, they are a necessity. They have made lives and they have saved lives. This is very much in keeping with Andrew Carnegie's belief that free public libraries provide people from every walk of life and every socioeconomic level with access to the knowledge and education that will help them advance in life. Vartan is also a distinguished author and has received numerous honors, including the Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civil award. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Vartan Gregorian. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Carolyn, for coming and gracing this occasion. Uh, fellow librarians and educators and citizens of New York and the nation. This is a special year for Carnegie Corporation of New York because it marks the 100th anniversary of the foundation Andrew Carnegie created to carry out his philanthropy during his lifetime and to carry it forward to the future. During our century of work, one of the proudest achievements is the part that Carnegie Corporation played in the first major cause that Andrew Carnegie supported and the one that was always closest to his heart, helping to build public libraries. Not one, not two, not 100, several thousand. And most importantly, that these have to be free libraries. Mr. Carnegie believed that libraries are essential to strength and progress of American society. They are the critical purposes they serve. They democratize access to information and knowledge. They empower local communities. But most importantly, they empower individuals to fulfill their aspirations and their potential. Libraries are among the first and most important institutions of our cultures. They embody the concept of lifelong education. After all, nobody can graduate from a library or wants to. There are no <laughs> examinations, midterms, there are no graduations. Libraries do not, do not give out diplomas. Libraries have no graduation ceremonies, then they don't give exams, as I mentioned. The only condition a library asks its users to honor is to do justice to their own imagination, their own curiosity, and their own thirst for knowledge and in the process to achieve their own independence of mind, spirit, and position in society. Libraries are also bridges that link the past, the present, and the future. How fortunate we are to have these remarkable, almost magical bridges that we can cross back and forth on as we explore the times that have passed and dream of the days ahead of us in the years to come. These bridges are inviting enough for an individual to stroll across and yet sturdy enough to support whole societies, whole nations. And in that connection, let me remind us also, all in America, which truly is a nation of immigrants, libraries are among the most important links that immigrants have between their native country and the country they have chosen to join. Libraries are a place of acculturation, of civic integration, of learning how to be part of America without losing the part of yourself that will always remember the place where you were born. Hence, libraries are an invaluable sources of the materials that help immigrants
to steep themselves in their past while also building their future. Libraries enable immigrants to join the life of our nation by allowing us the chance to universalize ourselves. And for those who have become assimilated, libraries are a way to return again and again to the banquet of their culture and to have their children share in that banquet as well. For all of us, libraries are both the symbol and living expression, not only of culture and history and learning, but also of the heritage of mankind, humankind. Walk down the aisles of a library and you're traveling through the record of civilization, the triumph of and failures, its legacy of intellectual, scientific, and artistic achievements. Hence, the library represents humanity's collective memory. It is more than just a repository. It's a truly instrument of civilization. The library is a laboratory of human endeavor, human inspirations, a window to the future, a wellspring of action. The library is a source of self renewal It's the link between the solitary individual and collective mankind. It represents our community. The library is the university of universities, containing the source and unity of knowledge. Almost everybody's life has been enriched by a teacher or what they learn in a library, hence by a librarian. But libraries would not be wonderful teaching and learning places that they are without librarians. And that is why we are here tonight to celebrate libraries and their librarians who are the true keepers of the flame of knowledge. Librarians are guides to knowledge, the ones who classify and clarify, authenticate and actualize our desire to find the tools we need to educate ourselves and to become educated individuals. Even in this age of internet, librarians are the men and women who help us to find our way along the electronic highway, and there are no more intellectually rigorous, imaginative, and professional tour guides one could find one for itself in the world than librarians. Indeed, that's the business of librarians, to help us find where we are going in life, and perhaps to go even further than that, because they are also in the immortality business, as well as enlightenment business, and the learning business, and democracy business. They are also in the equality business, because everyone is always welcome to occupy a library. The many branches of a library are like many stations of hope and imagination. At each station, there's also always a librarian there to welcome you and to answer your questions. So tonight, we thank all the librarians, and especially the 10 men and women who are being honored with the I Love My Librarian Award. They are extraordinary people with remarkable skills doing an irreplaceable job. We extend to our gratitude to them and offer our boundless congratulations. Tonight, I also would like to pay special tribute not only Janet Robinson, who's been the brains behind this, but also Rukea Bawa from South Africa, who is leaving us, who's leaving us after so many years of service in order to serve his, her country of uh, birth. So I'd like to thank you, Rukea, for keeping the flame of libraries alive even in, in New York City. And last but not least, I want also to congratulate ALA. ALA comes to New York, and we celebrate ALA because Chicago is not big enough for them, so they come here. <laughs> so welcome, ALA. I've welcomed you many times at the New York Public Library, and tonight I wore New York Public Library tie, so this, the one I gave you many, many years ago to for you to see that we remember ALA also. So LA, Carnegie Corporation, and New York Times, what a dynamic trio. So thank you very much. Now, last but not least, uh, I know I'm uh, maybe breaking a law, but I don't think I am, uh, because December board meeting, I'll be recommending to our board that the best way to celebrate Andrew Carnegie's legacy is to give $5 million to New, York public, New, York public, New York's public libraries. New York Public Library, Brooklyn Public Library, and Queens Public Library. 
the grants are for children, school children, in order to provide what Carolyn mentioned, to provide libraries for our children because many schools don't have the libraries. So with that, I hope New York once again will remember around the country and everywhere that Carnegie is well and alive, still likes books, still likes libraries, <laughs> still likes librarians. So thank you very much. Wonderful news. Thank you, Vartan. The American Li Library Association is the largest and most influential library association in the world. As the president of the ALA, Molly Raphael works tirelessly to ensure equal access to information, education, and lifelong learning. And who better to introduce our winning librarians than someone who believes deeply in intellectual freedom and public awareness of the crucial values of libraries, librarians, and literacy. Please join me in welcoming Molly Raphael. Thank you so much, Janet. This is the most fun that any of us has as president of the American Library Association. It's the, probably the proudest moment we have as well because it's recognition of the work that people do day in and day out in different types of libraries all across the country. So um, when I had the opportunity to stand in last year for Roberta Stevens, I was happy to do so, but I made sure that I could be here again as president because it's such a special occasion and one that we want to celebrate with all of you. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. I want to give special thanks again to the New York Times for conceiving of this idea many years ago, starting it in New York, but then recognizing that um, there was high value of spreading it across the country. I want to also thank um, Vartan Gregorian for the support that the Carnegie Corporation has given to this and really elevated this um, recognition of librarians. And I want to give special thanks to Caroline Kennedy for being here tonight and um, delivering remarks that really inspired, I think, everyone in the room. So thank, thank you all for that. Um. I stand here before you as um, president of the American Library Association, but I represent over 60,000 members of ALA. Um, and library users nationwide, and I um, am just absolutely delighted to be, be here. Andrew Carnegie believed that libraries, by providing access to knowledge and education to everyone, were the foundation of a democratic society. We cannot say how many lives Carnegie Libraries and all the libraries across the country now have touched in the past 100 years, but thanks to his vision and his commitment, Tonight, these 10 winners stand as testimony to the difference libraries and librarians from all types of libraries continue to make in the lives of their patrons and in their communities. We wish the Carnegie Corporation a special good wish at this centennial celebration, so thank you again. Before we honor this year's winners, I would like to acknowledge the 2011 I Love My Librarian Committee. So I'd ask them to stand. You can see them. I can't from the bright lights. Um, first, uh, Roberta Stevens, past president, who chairs this committee. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do that attempt to hold your applause till the end, if I can. Um, Ruke Abawa who, of the Carnegie Corporation, who Vartan just recognized. Diane McNulty from the New York Times, who represents the New York Times in this committee. Nancy Everhart from the American Association of School Librarians, which is a division of American Library Association. Lisa Janicki Henschlift, who is from the Association of College and Research Libraries. And Marsha Warner from the Public Library Association. So can we give them a round of applause? They sifted through over 1,700 nominations, although they had some help 
from some ALA staff, the Megans as I like to call them, so I want to recognize Megan Humphrey and Megan McFarland for the tremendous work they do in putting this together. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge Keith Michael Fields, the Executive Director of the American Library Association, who is here, as well as Maureen Sullivan, who is the President-elect of the American Library Association, and uh, Jim Neal, who is the Treasurer of the American Library Association, all of whom are here this evening. And now to our winners. I'd, act, I'd like to ask Roberta Stevens to join me here on the stage as we honor tonight's winners. Oh, other way. <laughs> so first, I have a special honor because this person comes from the library where I spent most of my career, the District of Columbia Public Library. Through its Adaptive Services Division, the DC Public Library helps the deaf community, visually impaired community, older adults, veterans, and injured service people better use the library. As head of the department, Venetia Dempson and her team help instill a sense of belonging and confidence in children who participate in Braille book clubs, introduce visually impaired teens to career opportunities, run game nights for blind and low vision gamers, and host sign language story hours. Said one of her community partners, Venetia's work creates exactly, quote, what a library should be, a safe haven for all, and a portal to the resources we need to enrich our lives. Venetia Dempson. Thank you, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the New York Times, and the American Library Association for this wonderful award. Of special significance to me was the source of my nomination, my talented staff, and the community of people with disabilities in the District of Columbia, whom I have the honor and privilege to serve. Together, we are transforming the Adaptive Services Division and the DC Public Library into an inclusive community place. I think that the description up there um, that was so nicely written uh, by my nominators touches upon many of the things uh, that we do in Adaptive Services. What I would like you all to know is that the community of people with disabilities are people, not disabilities. They are as diverse as our society at large with diverse needs and diverse capabilities. All we need to do is make things accessible for them, teach people how to use adaptive technology, and open the door for them to freely and independently pursue their interests, whether they be literary, educational, employment related, or just plain fun. The library is a safe and welcoming community place. In adaptive services, we also recognize that the library is not only a physical place, but it is becoming increasingly, uh, increasingly a virtual place. So we, in our programming, in our meetings, we attempt to include people by electronic means from places all over the country and in some cases all over the world. Um, so I would like to just end my comments once again by saying thank you so much. Um, this award is not so much for me as for the people that I serve. Thank you. So I'd like to invite the award recipients to come up to the stage as soon as you hear your name. 
Sometimes it's right at the beginning, sometimes it isn't. But I think it's nice that people can see you here as, as we're um, reading these descriptions. So Marty Faraby sets a tone that lets everyone know they are welcome at the Hackley Public Library's treasured 120-year-old historic landmark structure. Can we just stand up here? <laughs> Residents certainly get the message. In the past 10 years, the library has seen a 365% increase in visitors. In a county with 14% unemployment, the library offers help with resume writing and interview techniques, and its business resource center kickstarts dreams of entrepreneurship. For adult literacy students, Marty has created a friendly and quiet atmosphere. And she has partnered with local organizations to co-sponsor an essay contest for high school students. Next up, a million dollar renovation campaign to ensure the library is ready for the next generation of Muskegon residents. Marty Farabee. Well, the Hackley Public Library is housed in a 121-year-old Richardsonian Romanesque building inspired by Charles Hackley's reading of The Gospel of Wealth by Andrew Carnegie. The building has two towers, seven fireplaces, the original woodwork, a glass floor in the stacks area, two WPA murals in the children's department, Louis Millet stained glass windows, in a word, it is magnificent. One day I was walking through the library and I saw a child looking around, open-mouthed at all that magnificence. Lady, do you own this library? <laughs> no, I said, you do. The people of Muskegon own it together. Well, <laughs> and that's the point of why we're here. The library is about people. I am not the best librarian. I am not the brightest. I'm not the most knowledgeable. I'm certainly not even the tallest librarian. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that because my fellow librarian and my brother Peter Farabee is here tonight, and he's got me by two inches. <laughs> and I cannot tell you about the future libraries in 10 years, or in five years, or the impact of ebooks, or even what public libraries are going to be like next year. I'm pretty sure about tomorrow. Um, like thousands of other people, I'm just doing what I'm paid to do. I come in in the morning, I leave sometime at night. I'm doing what I'm trained to do and what I strongly believe in. I'm the one standing here before you receiving this very humbling honor. But public libraries happen because of people besides me. The people that are there lining up at 10 o'clock in the morning, the people that have to be reminded that the library is closing at night, the other people that work there, the friends of the library that nominated me, the trustees, the contributors and philanthropists, the people that pay their property taxes, God love them, <laughs> the people that vote. I am thrilled and humbled to receive this award on behalf of all those people. Thank you, Carnegie Corporation of New York. Thank you, New York Times. Thank you, American Library Association. does one need to be a strikingly intelligent business outreach librarian? According to Jennifer Cohane's nominator, 
Ellen Cartledge, who is with us tonight. One needs a, quote, unique combination of outreach, marketing, finance, information technology, and research skills, end quote, as well as engaging manner, professionalism, and creativity. Jennifer has used these skills at the Simsbury Public Library to create programs and services whose excellence is known throughout the state. Her program offers the unemployed not only a place to learn new skills, but a welcoming space to collaborate and network. As one local business person said, quote, Jennifer is one of the most brilliant shining gems that supports Connecticut's business community. Jennifer Cohen. I just have to say that we were all, um, I know from speaking to the other nine folks that we were all too intimidated to read each other's nominations. And uh, <laughs> I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you very much. About five years ago, I got a phone call. It was my dad. He was really, really excited. He'd just come back from a trip to Boston, and a highlight of his trip was a trip to the Boston Public Library. Jenny said, it was so great. It's an amazing space and I met a real librarian there. <laughs> Needless to say, it took me back a little, but it also got me thinking about what is a real librarian? My dad's recovering from knee surgery and couldn't be here, which is a real shame. I think he would have met a lot of real librarians tonight. <laughs> I know I have. I think being a real librarian is about caring, maybe too much, seeing need around you and creating programs, services, environments to help people in our communities thrive and to meet their needs and their dreams. I'm deeply honored and humbled and humbled to be recognized for my work. I'm also thrilled to see so many of my colleagues and friends come out and support tonight. I work with many special people. These patrons and clients and colleagues have become friends. They take the work out of the job. And I've got to say, Connecticut is a great place to be a librarian. Thank you to my director, Susan Bullock, our board of directors led by Charmaine Glue, our friends of the library, and my colleagues at the Simsbury Library. Every day, I realize how lucky I am that I landed at the Simsbury Public Library for my first library job. Those guys are always willing to step back and let me do my thing. You not only go along with some of my crazier ideas, but they even join in and help make them work. You all are yes people in the best possible way. Jewel Gutman, who's here tonight, is a forward-thinking businesswoman and friend. She funded the growth of our Business Resource Center. And Ellen Cartledge and Judy Rosenthal, my nominators. I think the real prize has been be being able to collaborate and get to know such amazingly accomplished women. So much of our work supporting job seekers in the region has been a shared effort. Thank you both. Thank you to the ALA and the Award Selection Committee. I really don't envy your job. I'm just grateful you considered me a winner. And thank you to the Carnegie Corporation of New York and the New York Times and, Amer and <clears throat> the New York Times. In an era where libraries are struggling to get the recognition for the role they play in their communities, it's so wonderful that you've taken the lead in making sure that we don't go unnoticed and unrewarded. Finally, I have to thank my friends and family, many who are here tonight. My sister and my mom are here, and they are always there for me. My wonderful in-laws, Tom and Susan, are here. My dad, my brothers, my sister-in-law, my nieces and nephews, who all wanted to be here but couldn't. And finally, I have to thank my husband, Bill, who puts up with my crazy schedule. He continuously makes me laugh, and he helps keep me real. Thank you. In his nomination for Dr. Rhonda Rios Kravitz, Sacramento City College student Roberto Guzman 
who is here with us tonight, said of Rhonda, quote, when you are around her, she makes anything seem possible. Rhonda has shepherded students who she met as undergrads all the way through their PhD programs, and then on to employment as a fellow academic. She also advises a caucus of undocumented students. Through her guidance, they have become impassioned advocates for public policies that directly affect their lives. As one faculty member said, quote, she is the most dedicated, enlightened, and progressive administrator and mentor on our campus. Educators do not get any better. Dr. Rhonda Rios Kravitz. You've seen one of the tall librarians, and now you get to see one of the short librarians who always needs to do this. Um, podiums always, for me, are a little intimidating because I always feel like I need one of those little boxes to stand above them. Um, I've been a librarian for over 30 years, and today I work, fortunately, in an urban, publicly funded community college, Sacramento City College in Sacramento, California. I see firsthand on an everyday basis how important access to education is and how important libraries are to our students. My students cannot afford to buy their textbooks and our library becomes a major way for them to access information. I have learned so much from all my students. I have learned about hope, I have learned about resilience and what it means to have a commitment to make a difference in the world. As a librarian and now as a dean, I feel fortunate to work in a profession that has enabled me to address the achievement gap, to fight against inequities, and to work for equality. As a librarian, I'm definitely committed to social justice. I, along with many of my librarian colleagues, know that ethics and values matter, and that we work for the common good. I feel deeply humbled by this award and grateful to have worked with so many outstanding individuals. I really need to give special thanks to all the staff and faculty at both Sacramento State and Sacramento City College, and to all of the individuals who nominated me, including my dreamers, as you've heard, Roberta Guzman, who's in the audience, who every day face barriers but persevere I'm also very grateful to another group of students called Voices of Hope. This group of students are students with disabilities who work to tell us every day that we need to dispel our, dis our stereotypes and we need to celebrate their accomplishments. I cannot leave without thanking my family. My husband, Steve, who's in the audience, my mother, and my daughter. And I have to tell you a special story about my daughter. She got her first library card when she was four. It was 1989. We walked in the library, and when we were in the library, there was an earthquake. California is obviously known for its earthquakes. So I always say of her library card experience, it was definitely an earth-shaking and moving experience, <laughs> never ever to be forgotten. <laughs> I also need to thank my library school colleagues, one who is with me today, Gay, so we have, we graduated in 1979, we started in 78, and we've remained colleagues and friends and keep sharing what this profession needs to me. I need to thank all of you who made this award possible. The Carnegie Organization, the New York Times, and the American Library Organization. Um, or I should say, American Library Association. But I really also want to thank all those special committees that I've worked with over the years, and particularly the ethnic caucuses I'm a past president of Reforma and is my reformistas who have really taught me, like the Carnegie Organization says, that we are here to do real and permanent good, that we have a purpose, and that purpose can never be forgotten. Again, I would love to thank all of the nine other um, nominees and awardees. This has been such a special evening for me. 
I will be grateful for the rest of my life for having the opportunity to meet and to know them. Muchísimas gracias. Jennifer Lagarde's unparalleled passion for and dedication to her craft and hard work as the librarian at Myrtle Grove Middle School made a true believer out of nominator and teacher Kate Taylor. Jennifer collaborated with Kate on a literacy research project that Kate says changed her instructional life and the reading lives of her students forever. Last year, Jennifer spearheaded a pilot e-reader program. She put the coveted devices into the hands of struggling seventh grade readers who became the school's e-readers ambassadors. The program changed the students' outlook on reading and ultimately made the school a better place. Jennifer Lagarde. Wow. I don't think I have to tell anyone in this room that this has been a tough year for libraries. But this celebration, this award, the work of the nine people who are sitting beside me in the front row, and the work of all the people who now are manning the reference desk or writing lesson plans instead of hobnobbing with Caroline Kennedy in New York City. <laughs> Um, all of that confirms for me what I think everyone in this room also knows, and that is that libraries, librarians, and most importantly, our patrons are worth fighting for. So it's with that renewed sense of purpose that I humbly but feistily accept this award <laughs> on behalf of the students and staff at Myrtle Grove Middle School, without whom my work wouldn't even exist. I have to thank the Carnegie Corporation, the New York Times, the American Library Association, even the Megans, who I'm forbidden to mention, and Ms. Kate Taylor, who nominated me, my principal, who always says yes, no matter what crazy idea I have, and all of you, thank you so much for this award. And finally, my dear, sweet husband, David, who for some strange reason thought when I became a librarian, I'd work fewer hours instead of more. <laughs> Sorry, darling. Thank you. And now Roberta and I will switch places, and she will announce the five additional recipients. Thank you, Molly. Since the opening in 2002 of Dobie's Mill Elementary School in rural South Carolina, and despite continual budget woes, Betsy Long has managed to double the library's media collection and create an inviting learning space. Reenactments of visits to early 20th century Ellis Island and a pen pal exchange with students at a school in Africa are just two examples of how Betsy enhances student learning. Betsy also created a morning exercise club for at-risk students with the goal of boosting their self-confidence while mentally and physically preparing for their day. Her principal and monitor, Ginger Cato, who is here with us tonight, says Betsy is always innovative, creative, and forward-looking. She is a fabulous role model for all of us, Betsy Long. I would think we mixed up a plaque, and so I have, the, yes, okay. <laughs> okay. No. Where, where did I? We will retrieve the plaque from Rhonda. I believe that's the one that got. Okay. <laughs> well, I can be Rhonda. <laughs> she was pretty great. <laughs> Okay. 
If I have seen further, it is only by standing on the shoulder of giants. This is a phrase that's been used by Sir Isaac Newton, the rock band REM, and many others throughout history to describe different situations. It's an especially meaningful quote to me because I have so many giants to thank as I accept this award. First, I'd like to thank my mom and dad who carted me to the public library countless times as a child and provided me comfortable laps for hours of reading adventure. Then there's Andrew Carnegie, who gave our nation some of its first public libraries. I also have to recognize Horace Mann, who worked hard to establish libraries in public schools. Finally, I must give thanks to supportive administrators like my principal, Ginger Cato, who trusts that I know how to do my job well and encourages me to strive to do better each and every day so that more children may witness the magic of good literature. I would also like to thank Carnegie Corporation of New York, the New York Times, and the American Library Association who have made this event possible. Thank you all for allowing me this incredible honor, and thank you to all my children and everyone else at my school who make me proud to be a librarian and love being a librarian. Thank you. The library at New Canaan High School is truly a destination for active and engaged learning. Thanks to Michelle Ludela's open arms, open, arms open <laughs> attitude towards change and integration of new technology into learning. Her nominator, New Canaan student Michael DiMattia, who is here with us this evening, says that Michelle and her team make themselves completely accessible in the library and through social media and online course management software. Michelle has also fostered the use of Facebook to encourage group collaboration and communication school-wide. She is a true innovator, an impressive teacher, talented organizer, proactive researcher, and a bit of a tech geek, said Michael. <laughs> Michelle Ludela. Geek. <laughs> My daughter will be proud. <laughs> um, Carnegie Corporation of New York, uh, American Library Association and the New York Times, and Michael DiMattia, thank you for this honor. In the fall of 2009, New York Times op-ed columnist wrote, Tom Friedman wrote a piece called The New Untouchables. It was about the role of education in creating recession-proof workers. And he challenged schools to grow learners who could make, with the imagination to make themselves untouchable, um, to invent smarter ways of doing old jobs, greener ways of providing new services, new ways to attract old customers and combine existing technologies. He said, we don't need more education. We need the right education. So one might assume that Michael and I are standing here because we do things right at New Canaan High School Library but that's actually not it. Um, we do a lot of things right, but we're here because we are given permission to experiment and to make mistakes. And that is the beauty of true learning. Learning is fun, it's interactive, it involves risk, it requires imagination, curiosity, and perseverance. And all of us at New Canaan High School, students and teachers are like, we're permitted that luxury, the luxury of the right education. So my colleague Christina Russo and I strive to deliver a school library program that empowers members of the New Canaan High School community to be better self-directed and more adaptable learners. We coach students to become their own teachers. It's clear that we share in the collective responsibility for the community's learning. And so this award belongs to that community for trusting and empowering its school librarians to innovate learning with students, 
by, um, to experiment and to evolve and to grow. And by granting teachers the right education, you ensure students an even better one. So this evening's recognition honors that principle. Thank you. Librarian Sandra Ross Forrest has such enthusiasm for the North Avondale neighborhood of Birmingham, Alabama, that when she talks about what she's doing in the community, her nominator says that she actually glows. Sandra has turned the library, which is in the middle of two public housing communities, into a valued, safe learning place. Sandra has led school supply giveaways has started a group for young mothers, and drops off books and treats to homebound elderly patrons. The North Avondale community has demonstrated an equal amount of enthusiasm for the library. During recent budget threats, one classroom collected $20 worth of pennies and donated it to the library. Sandra Ross Forrest. Mm -hmm. Good evening. As I stand before you tonight, I want you to know that I feel like the luckiest girl in the world. I feel lucky because I was selected for this amazing award. I feel lucky because so many people believed in me. To be recognized as a champion in your field does not happen often. Tonight, I'm blessed to be standing in the winner's circle. I did not get to this point alone. There's so many people I want to thank including Carnegie Corporation of New York, the New York Times, and the American Library Association. I also want to thank some of my biggest cheerleaders, my husband, my family, the Birmingham Public Library System, my patrons, and of course, my nominator, Gwendolyn B. Guster Welch. I can stand here tonight and tell you that I truly love what I do. I was born to be a librarian, a librarian who not only loves books, but her community. I know it, my patrons know it, and God knows it. He guided me to take this path, a path that I look forward to taking each day I go to work. Again, I want to thank you for this opportunity. It's an experience I won't forget. Thank you. Rebecca Traub has become one of the most valuable resources at Temple University Harrisburg, a satellite campus of Temple University in Philadelphia. In addition to introducing students to research methods, Rebecca proofs student papers and has developed a writing seminar turned webinar so that the campus has busy graduate students that can access it at any time. She also developed a home in the library for adjunct faculty, complete with a desk reference to orient these valuable part-time instructors to the campus. Rebecca Traub is a role model, an inspiration for both faculty and students. As one faculty member said, it is quite a testament when graduating students recognize Rebecca as one of the main reasons they were successful. Rebecca Traub. I'd like to thank the Academy. <laughs> I told one of my friends that I was receiving this award and coming to New York City, and she said, it's just like winning a Tony or an Oscar in your category. And I said, OK, thanks. <laughs> but I really would like to thank the Carnegie Cor 
Corporation of New York, the New York Times, um, for their um, support and notice of librarians when librarians are usually sort of quiet people and sometimes not too pushy, but they recognize all the nice things that they do for their patrons and their students. I also like to thank the American Library Association for all they do to inform, support, and advocate for libraries and librarians. And um, of course, the selection committee who read through all those and picked mine to win because I, I can't believe it. It's really a thrill. But most of all, I'd like to thank my dear friend Claudia who <laughs> nominated me. Um, we, I've only been a librarian for five and a half years. In my previous life, I was a middle school Latin teacher. <laughs> so librarian to Latin teacher, uh, Latin teacher to librarian. It's a weird combination, I think. But um, Dr. Duane, Claudia Duane, my nominator, who I now call Dr. Denominator, um, was, is, I'm just so thrilled that she um, noticed the work that I did in the time that I've been there and that she found others who would help her write the nomination speak, speech um, or nomination report. Um, the other contributors who um, gave their insight so that I could get this award and the director of Temple Harrisburg, um, Link Martin. I'd also like to thank um, my family, my beautiful daughter who's here tonight, who when I went back to library school in, in 1998 and finished in 2001, she went to college, she proofread my papers for me and she listened to my <laughs> library stories. I'd like to thank my son for whom I missed some of his senior year football games because I was going to library school. And I'd like to thank my husband, who with my new library hours that aren't the same as teaching hours, has taken over all the cooking duties. <laughs> Which is really nice to come home and have the meal all ready for me. Um, when, when I got to Temple Harrisburg five and a half years ago, the previous librarian had left five and a half months earlier and it had been reasonably dark during that time. So it, there was a lot to be done, and I'm sort of a one-man band. I'm the only librarian there. Uh, Temple Harrisburg is in a shopping mall with a lot of other government offices, and right out my windows is a dress barn. <laughs> <laughs> Our students are graduate students in social work, education, edu educational administration, community regional planning, and um, we have some um, interns at the capital of Harrisburg. So um, we are mostly a night and weekend school of non-traditional students. So it is a variety of people that I serve and it has been a pleasure to work with them for the last five and a half years. And I have to say that, that receiving this award, that somebody loves their library and I really love my library. And thank you very much. During her 18 years at Ivy Tech Community College of Indiana, Barbara Weaver has worked diligently to improve the lives of the students at the college's four campuses. She helped establish the Michigan City Campus Library, which she is currently in the process of redesigning, and developed Ivy Tech's peer tutoring program, which she coordinated for 17 years until her guidance made it its own full-time department. She connects the campuses and their communities through the Northwest Indiana One Book Reading Initiative, Books to Bridge the Region. She also excites a passion for reading among the community's youngest, youngest members by providing a collection of picture books for students, children, while their parents utilize the resources at the library. Barbara Weaver. Thank you very much. I grew up in the cornfields of central Indiana. And then I went north to northwest Indiana where I got to work in two public libraries 
and then the last 18 years in a community college library. And when I heard I was one of the 10 winners nationwide, I just, I felt like I was being crowned Miss Indiana. <laughs> Seriously, special thanks are due. First, I want to thank the New York Times, the American Library Association, Carnegie Corporation of New York. This is a tremendous way of honoring dedicated librarians in the field who are making a difference in the lives of patrons, whether they are students, young students, or college students, like the ones I serve. There are so many worthy people out there who could be up here receiving an award tonight. So I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be here for them. In particular, I want to thank my nominator, Becky Sakopoulos from Ivy Tech, who believed in me and enough to want to nominate me. Her simple gesture has done volumes to validate what I do every day in the libraries of Ivy Tech Community College. One of the things that I've been involved with recently as a college librarian has been focusing on literacy, spreading the word about the power of reading, reading for enjoyment, reading for expanding one mind, reading to engage with others in meaningful discussions on important topics, whether it's worth reading a novel or reading about someone's life story. I thank the Literacy Reading Initiative Group, Books to Bridge Region, this strictly voluntary group of librarians across the seven counties of Northwest Indiana are composed of public school and academic librarians. And together with them and Ivy Tech, we have introduced our college students to new levels of reading, to the joys of book discussions. We have taken cultural field trips, brought authors to the college, and a play that widens our students' perspective on the world and on their lives. But mostly I want to thank Ivy Tech Community College Northwest, its Chancellor, Lupe Baltiera, and others who believe in the library's role in academia, who have thrown their support behind the library's mission. And I would be amiss if I did not also thank the good Lord for his many blessings, for the wonderful friends I have, for my parents who are deceased, for my family who still inspire and instill the values that I started with, hard work, respect for others, and a love for books. And early on, at the age of three, when I became severely handicapped with a hearing loss, my parents never stopped my dreaming. They said, whatever you want to do, we'll be behind you. Whether it was learning to play the piano, reading books, getting involved, being a journalist, and I turned out to be a librarian, they were behind me. They never said there was anything that could stop you. So believe in your dreams. Don't ever give up. Believe in your li libraries of the future, in America's libraries. Thank you so very much. And I just really will never forget this night. You have all been a part of it. And to be here in New York City, in this beautiful city, has been a special honor. Thank you. What a wonderful evening. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. This has been a most extraordinary event. I want to thank Vartan and the Carnegie Corporation of New York for their generosity and public spiritedness. Particular thanks to Carnegie Corporation's Rukaya Bawa for overseeing this program. I would also like to thank the Megans, <laughs> even though I guess I'm not supposed to mention them, right? <laughs> the Megans for all of their hard work. We have a number of special guests here this evening that I wanted to thank <clears throat> uh, as well for being part of this special evening. Kate Levin, Commissioner of Cultural Affairs for New York City. Tony Marks, the new head of the New York Public Library. And Thomas Galante, head of the Queens Public Library. And Linda Johnson, head of the Brooklyn Public Library. And I want to say once again, congratulations to this year's I Love My Librarian Award winners. 
You have our respect and admiration for all that you do each and every day and for all that you have accomplished. We are most grateful. Thank you, good evening, and happy holidays. <laughs>